Welcome to the session. Today we are going to talk about large scale migrations to serverless. Organizations are migrating to the cloud. They are migrating critical applications that are very important to the business. But these applications sometimes are entirely coupled into a monolith and they are difficult to change. To stay competitive, they need to transform their application to an agile architecture, and then the customer will have more time to focus on their business. Read and rewrite the application can be risky, time consuming, and expensive as well. Then, a large scale migration in a phased manner can be a good idea. It will provide a minor effort on code changes. But before that, let me introduce myself. My name is Ivan Coimbra. I'm a migration partner, solutions architect. I have been working in migrations with AWS in the last four years. I have, I have here with me my colleague, Amit Bajaj. Amit, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. I'm Amit Bajaj. I'm a partner solutions architect with the migrations team and modernization team. And I hope you all are enjoying your uh, reInvent 2021. Thank you so much, Amit. So I have some questions for you. So please raise your hand if you uh, ever worked on a migration project. Please raise your hand. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Please raise your hand if you have refactored a legacy application. Oh, that's cool. Like half of the audience. Looks like that you are in the right session. <laughs> okay, in our agenda today, we will dive deep into migration and modernization. We will also uh, dive deep into uh, architecture evolution to AWS-based serverless architecture. We will talk about the customer modernization journey as well. That will include assets, mobilize, and sure, the modernization. We will dive deep into a case-based serverless services and architecture as well. And in the end, we will leave you with some helpful resources that will help you when you are building a large-scale serverless application. So, but why the customers are migrating to AWS? Well, we can say three main reasons why the customers are migrating. The first reason is cost reduction. The customers are looking to save money, and only the migration to AWS, they can immediately save something between 25 and 50%. The second reason is agility. They need to move quicker. They need to have like a faster response to any change because then they will have more time and again focus on their business. And the last thing is innovation. They want to improve the cost, their customer experience. They want to provide a better service. Let's dive deep and see how customers can take care of these three benefits. When we talk about migration and modernization, we have to keep in mind that uh, long journey sometimes. By the word, migration. So customer wants to replicate their system to AWS. They don't have the immediate idea to change features, but they will have benefits in the platform. For example, they can take advantage of an auto-scaling group if they are migrating to EC2 immediately. But then, when we talk about modernization, the customer wants to have more features. And then they, we are talking about the redesign. We are talking about the re-architecture. And they have intention to have more features. But some features, they will be long-term features, right? So when you have uh, uh, modernization, we are talking about uh, automation, infrastructure automation, or system automation and DevOps and things like that. So keep in mind that the modernization is a journey and the benefit when you are performing the modernization, they are long-term and multidimensional as well. 
But what is a servlet? Which are the main characteristics of a serverless application? The first thing, they are designed as a loosely coupled business function. Each part has a function. For example, you can have like a shopping cart, or even you can have the authentication. Each part has a business function. The second characteristic is that they are packaged as a lightweight containers or functions. There will be a small part that will be responsible for one specific thing. And also, they are architected with a clear, uh, with a clear separation between stateless and stateful. Because remember that if we are talking about stateful, you will need a persistent storage. But when we talk about serverless, serverless has no dependence, and so it's easy to scale. And they are deployed on a self serve elastic, and resilient infrastructure. You don't need to worry about deploy it in MUT-AZ, or you don't have to worry how you will scale, right? And so you can focus more uh, on the code. And they are isolated from server and operating system. You don't need to worry if there will be a file system or if the file system will have space available and things like that. This slide is probably not new for you, but I would like to quickly talk about it. Here we see what we call the seven R's, the, the seven ways that you can migrate. The first one is that we call relocate. When we talk about the relocate, we are talking about that you are migrating a virtual machine, for example, a VMware to VMware on AWS. Or maybe you are moving your container to a ECS or AKS. We have the rehost. When you are migrating as this, that's uh, also known as lift and shift. You can migrate your uh, virtual machine to EC2, for example, and we have great tools to do it, like application migration service, the DMGN, that can convert your virtual machine to uh, EC2. We have the replatform as well, that when you are migrating, for example, a database running a virtual machine to a RDS is a good example. We have the repurchase when you need to acquire a new application, for example, that's also known as a drop and chop. We have the refactoring when it's necessary to rewrite a code because you are probably, when you need probably to decouple the application. We have the return when you are not migrating and we have the retire as well when the application is not in use or won't be used anymore. But what's the evolution to serverless? How it works? So we have the approach that we call two-step approach. First, migrate, and then modernize. It's much easier to modernize or to transform your application if the application is already running on AWS. So in the first leg, we have to migrate. And then you can have the patterns like the rehost, that we mentioned, the relocate or the replatform. A good example is if you have a legacy Unix operating system, for example, and if you are migrating to Linux, is a good example. Once that your application is running on AWS, it's time to modernize it. And then you can use uh, the pattern like a replatform or a refactor, for example. In the modernization phase, in AWS, we follow the three-phase approach. They are exactly the same cycle that we have in the migration. We have the assets, we have the mobilize, and we have the modernize. Let's dive deep in each phase. In the assets phase, we have customers that probably will have hundreds of applications, hundreds of workloads. But it's a good idea to identify two or three applications that can be a good candidate for the modernization. What applications can be a good candidate for the modernization without impacting the business? Which applications can be modernized in midterm or in long term? And which applications are good candidates to be retired as well? And then you can use an approach where you will analyze the strategic or business impact, the financial fit of that application, or the application reliability, or then the application modularity, 
or then the data migration needs. And then here we can see uh, on the top left quadrant an application that's a not good candidate for the modernization because there will be a high business impact. But if you look at the uh, uh, bottom right quadrant, they are good because they are ready to modernize and there will be a low impact to the business. And remember that you can validate your approach with a low impact with the business. So it's a very good idea to start with application that will have a low impact to the business. All right, once that you identify two applications that are good candidates to the migration, it's time to dive deep into the application and understand your application very well. You, it's a good idea to analyze things like performance, to talk with the application owners, to get their technology about the application. And then, when you do that, uh, you will have data points like those, like these data points, like pro what, what are the programming language, which are the software vulnerabilities, what are the software versions? Which type of requirements I will need to migrate to a serverless application? It will help you to draw your target serverless architecture. Now, I would like to invite my colleague Amt Bajaj to talk. Amt, is all yours. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So, as uh, you know, Ivan mentioned. You, you start performing the assess phase first, where you start an understanding the application really well uh, by doing the runtime code analysis or the static code analysis, or you know gathering the no institutional knowledge from the application owners. That's really uh, paved the way for your current. What is the current state architecture looks like? What's the target state architecture I want to start with? So then you know you get into the mobilized phase where you start thinking about the foundation piece of the modernization uh, the modernization happening in future so the f when we say about foundation i'm going to share three things here which are really important for that so the first thing is build the foundation um, there's a service called aws control tower that is our way of building a foundation which we call it as landing zone right so Control Tower is a, multi, uh, is, is a service which creates a multi-account environment for your modernization needs. And in those, in those environments are uh, you know, pre-provisioned. Uh, on, on the launch, it will be pre-provisioned with some of the best practices, as, uh, and it will be done using the blueprints. The blueprints for the identity management, blueprints for the federated access to the accounts, blueprints for, the, uh, for any account baselines. So using the Control Tower, when, when, any, when any developer is going to provision an account, developer does not have to worry about the infrastructure needs because all of the best practices are defined, will be implemented at the launch of the account, and it, we call it account baseline. Um, account baseline could be anything such as enabling an AWS cloud trail or enabling an AWS config services. These are the best practices which comes as part of the blueprint in, within the control tower. So, uh, and, and you can, you can add as many blueprints as you want, and you can align those with your own organization policies. And of course, start iterating on it. Second, uh, second thing is I want to talk about is the, the DevOps uh, principles here. And of course, one of the, you, you cannot avoid this, of course, uh, the continuous integration and continuous deployment. So start using that, start using that as part of your deployment pipelines, and you know, if, if it is the first time we are heading into some kind of a serverless application development, then, you know, just go to AWS console and use the Lambda applications. It will automatically give you the CI CD pipeline, which is a basic uh, CI CD pipeline. But if it is really the enterprise uh, scale of a modernization project, as well as if it is really the, uh, the, if it is really the, you know, advanced level of features you want in your pipeline, Take, take, care, uh, you know, take note of this uh, particular quick start, which we have developed along with our partner. Um, and it is an advanced CI CD pipeline, which gives you multiple features uh, for your, uh, you know, advanced features such as, you know, feature branching, feature toggling, and, you know, e even auto discovering those branches. And it also takes care of the multi team, you know, development environment when you are, uh, when you have a multi multiple teams doing modernization on multiple applications. 
And then the third, third part of it is the, the, from the foundation is the best practices. As you all know, uh, in AWS, we have the be best practices for our architectures as part of well architect principle. There are like five pillars in this uh, well architect principle, and I'm going to explain those five pillars using a very simple applications on here on the screen. And the simple application is where you see that this ap application, clients are accessing this application using the API gateway. And application is hosted on um, you know, Lambda functions or set of Lambda functions and backend by the DynamoDB purpose-built database. So this is a very simple application. And we're going to talk about it. Uh, we're going to take a journey on this, how we can make this application uh, really a production-ready application by following the best practices so that we have those foundational pieces in mind when we are modernizing. So the first thing is about from the operations uh, design principles. So on this application, Enable the tracing of a transaction. Enable the structured logging. How you do that is, you know, have, have, a, have that unique ID or have that, you know, we, some people call it conversation ID for each transaction. That will make your operations really easy. And you can use AWS X-ray services or the AWS CloudWatch metrics uh, services for, uh, to, do the, to enable that logging as well as to look for the transactions once it is logged. No matter where the transaction is in the, in the downstream, each log will have that unique ID, which will help you to bind the transaction. And that will help the operations to make it easy, whether it is for tracing, or whether it is for debugging, or whether it is for you know, trend analysis for a particular uh, business. From the reliability perspective, I would say enable the you know, inbound access rates right at the API gateway. You know, limit those uh, rates. Uh, as shown in this example, limit those rates, maybe 100 requests per second or so, depending on what type of application it is. And by just limiting a rate, uh, first thing, of course, you will help to reduce the cost. Um, and second is, you will help to uh, avoid those bad actors attacking your applications. And uh, you will also help to avoid uh, the, uh, you will also help to maintain the resiliency of the application because if there are any type of, any non-serverless type of services downstream, such as uh, if you're using any application hosted on EC2 or any application hosted on RDS, you can limit those rates uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, to, for those services so that those services doesn't get throttled. Next thing is about the security. Um, introduce an authorizer right at the API gateway. Maybe use a AWS partner's third-party authorizer or use the AWS Cognito service for authorizing each transaction coming into the flow. And then you, for any data sensitivity needs, use the secrets manager. Uh, if there are like hundreds of Lambda functions building up this particular business function uh, and they need to access the secrets manager, of course, keep a watch on the secrets manager quota limits. Uh, increase those quota limits before you start using those. And then... Uh, there are two points uh, I want to make for the performance perspective. One is from the A Amazon API gateway, uh, where you can enable the regional endpoints if you know that all of the users are going to be from the same geography. And si similarly, on the, on the DynamoDB side, if it, is the, if it is the first time you are enabling this application, uh, and if it is something like a pilot application or initializing this uh, at the first, you, you don't know how much the, you know, what kind of customer's behavior gonna be, what kind of customer's traffic gonna be. Enable the on-demand DynamoDB uh, billing. And if it is something that over the time you learn that how much the throughput requirements are, then uh, of course go to the DynamoDB and set up your throughput limits. That will really help to improve the performance of the overall application. In the last, but not the least, the cost perspective. So, in the cost, here we are using so many of Lambda functions uh, uh, to build a business function, right? Minimizing the, uh, minimum, minimizing the memory requirements on the Lambda function does not always guarantee the minimizing the cost. So you have to tune your Lambda functions for, 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 those, uh, for the cost, for the speed, or you know, with, the, with the balanced approach. I'm going to share a GitHub repo link as part of the resources in this session, which will help you to tune your Lambda either for the cost or speed or a balance between cost and the speed, right? So that's how you have to tune your Lambda so that you can, you can uh, you know, balance your cost. So now that we have some of the foundational pieces in mind, 
Next step is really start modernizing. So we'll get into the modernized phase here, uh, where we gonna uh, where we have a you know many different industry patterns, as you all know. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been using those patterns uh, to modernize your applications. So we're going to talk about three of such patterns and, of course, uh, run into the demo for uh, one of the patterns. So use those patterns. No need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and use it in an iterative manner. And there should be a value addition at each, uh, at each step in that iterations. So the first is a strangler pick pattern. Um, in 2004, Jim Fowler, who is considered to be the founder of this pattern, has written, written a blog about it. And uh, this pattern is really about how you can carve out or extract the business functionalities out of your monolithic applications. And the candidate application for this pattern is where the application is using third-party products, or application is a headless application where it does not have any upstream dependency. Consumers are accessing this application directly and uh, you know the, the technology stack is something that you don't want to change over the time. You want to keep the technology stack same as, as you modernize this application. So here is one of the examples where the application is hosted on a you know, EC2, which we migrated from on-premises to AWS. Uh, as my friend told, uh, there's a two-leg approach. So, so once, it is my, once, once it is migrated and it is hosted on EC2 and backed by um, you know, relational database uh, could be RDS or could be a database on hosted on the EC2, and then front-ended by the load balancer, and the consumers are directly accessing this application. So, how do we do uh, the iterative modernization of this application? Introduce or intercept the traffic through the API gateway. That is the first step. By just introducing API gateway, we have uh, made this architecture better because API Gateway will provide you the inbound access rating. Uh, you can limit that. It will provide you the content or the context-based routing. It will also provide the security by plugging in the authorizers to it. So by just introducing API Gateway, we are making this uh, architecture a little better uh, in the right direction. Next, uh, you, you, start, you start extracting the business functionality out of the monolith. For example, uh, during the discovery phase, as Ivan mentioned, we found that it, this particular application has five different functions, and one of the functions is very, uh, you know, uh, it, it has a, it, it's important for the business, and we want to carve out and host it on a se host it separately. So, carve out that business functionality into the serverless uh, services. One of the serverless services is Fargate, so you can carve out that in a in a container and host it on a Fargate. Then you don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. And it could be backend by the DynamoDB database, which is a purpose-built database here for that particular business function. Once you, start, once you validate and test it completely, you start rerouting the traffic from API Gateway down to this, Farge, uh, down to this uh, business function hosted on a Fargate. This could be, there could be another approach. Uh, if you are a business function, you don't want to host it on a container, or if it doesn't make sense to host it on a container, create a serverless uh, business function using AWS Lambda, and then route the traffic uh, to the function hosted on the Lambda. This could be your transition uh, architecture. Like during the transition period, this could be your architecture where some of the business functions are still lying in a monolith. Some of the business functions you think the Fargate is the right uh, place, right home. Some of the functions you have moved to the Lambdas. Our goal is to move out all of the functions out of the monolithic application and host it on the serverless stack. That's the end goal we want to achieve, and this will give you all those serverless characteristics which Ivan mentioned during the um, first part of the session. One of the customer, HSBC UK, did exactly that using the Strangler pick pattern. Uh, they, they, they presented their talk back in 2018 reInvent, and of course, there's a link there. You can uh, watch it in detail. I'm going to just summarize it, how they did it. Uh, so they had a notification service where customers want to know about their credits and the debits on their accounts. And customer just uh, using the mobile app, customer will log into their uh, mobile app and set their customer preferences. And HSBC was having all of their data hosted in the legacy app monolithic application on the mainframe systems on the, on the, on the left side. 
And then, as we know, to, to have this data consumed by the serverless stack, of course, we need to convert that um, Aero Absodic format data coming in from the mainframe into JSON format. So they used Apache NiFi. And then they use that data, JSON, once it is in JSON format, they use that data to create their notification service, to create their data services, and to create their messaging services for that particular uh, notification business function. So I'll, I'll just play it out all the animations here, just to show that how they used all the serverless stack services to build their notification business functionality. And uh, I would highly encourage to, you know, watch that, watch that, uh, you know, reinvent video, and it'll, it'll give you a lot of insight into how that they follow the Strangler 6 pattern to implement this. Next. And we are really excited to announce the preview launch of Migration Hub Refactor Spaces as of today at this reinvent. And this is really, uh, the re MS, uh, Migration Hub has many more capabilities, and Refactor Spaces is one of the capability which is launched this year uh, at reInvent. And this capability is actually to provide you the refactor environment for your, for your, uh, uh, for your evolving applications when you have to extract the bus different business functionalities out to the serverless services. And it also provides you, uh, it also provides those developers a shield from the infrastructure changes as well as provide those consumers a, a secure way of accessing your uh, new modernized applications. Uh, re, uh, refactor spaces uh, actually, you know, separates the separates the modern applications from your monolithic applications through the boundary of accounts. So different accounts managing different applications, and they are secured right in their own accounts. And it also gives you the routing uh, as you move away from your monolithic based business functions to the modernized services based business functions. And it will take care of all that routing by itself uh, in with with a with a with a few clicks. So uh, please go check it out, and I'm going to share the resources where you can get your hands dirty um, in, in, at this reinvent. The next pattern is about the branch by abstraction pattern. This pattern is where uh, the candidate application is which uh, application which has an upstream dependency. For example, in this case, create notifications is one of the business function we want to extract it out and orders and invoice functionalities depend on that, right? So we want to carve out how to do it. Uh, and then there, is a can, then, uh, there is a mandate from the organization that we, don't, can, we, we cannot have a uh, downtime. We need to have that transition with a zero downtime. That's, and then incremental delivery is acceptable to the, to the, to the you know, organization, where each change will make it to the production. And as soon as we make that change into production, we are we are just one step away from the stable state if something falls off. So for that matter, what, we, what do we do is the first step, we create a proxy. Like in Strangler 6 pattern, we created a proxy at the infrastructure level We're using API Gateway. Here we are just using the programming language to create a proxy. In Java, we call it interface. In .NET, we might call it something else. So just create the programming level proxy layer which is the notification interface in this case. And start routing the traffic to the create notifications business function. Now, when that is happening, in parallel, we will start extracting the business function onto the lambdas, and then create a stub within the monolith. The stub is called here service calling implementation on the right, and that stub will help to call the business functionality outside hosted on the lambda function. Once we know that your Lambda-based business functionality is working fine, you start routing the traffic. Sometimes we don't do a you know, one-time or immediate routing the traffic. We do a, you know, different deployment options are there. Sometimes customers tend to do a canary release where we only sending the 10% of the traffic, traffic outside to the business functions hosted on the Lambdas. Once we know that Lambdas can be a source of truth and uh, and it can serve just like a function hosted in monolith, we will start routing the traffic to outside. And then remove, uh, and then you know, get rid of the create notification functionality within the monolith. And as you can imagine, each step 
is supported by the feature flagging and the feature toggling. The feature flagging and toggling is a is an approach we use a lot in uh, modernizing the applications where every change is just about toggling a flag from yes to no, one to three, or whatever that you know uh, standard's going to be in your organization. And for and every every uh, at every switch, uh, you move the you move the change to production. And if it is in production, if you are if you are like if the application is not behaving well, you are just a one step or one toggle away from your stable state. And then start cleaning up, uh, remove the interface which you created earlier, and start uh, routing the traffic outside uh, using that stub. So that's the way you will host your application on the lambdas, and your monolith uh, upstream dependencies will still be able to call your uh, create notification. One of the customers, Stitch Fix, did exactly that. And they, uh, they followed a six-step approach. And I have shared a link down below. They presented their talk in reInvent 2019. And I got an opportunity to work with them. And uh, they have a six-step, they created a six-step playbook to uh, modernize their 30 of their applications from their monolithic databases to the microservice-based databases. And each step was having a concrete definition of done. And they used uh, one of the AWS partners' observability platform to make sure that at each step, they are gathering the metrics and they are gathering the traces to understand how much, uh, how much transition has already happened and how much it is pending. And that's how they use um, these six-step playbook. Now, we spoke about the uh, applications. Now, data uh, application is not modernized if data is not modernized. So we have to think about the data. So one of the patterns I'm going to talk about is the data, uh, moving the data referential integrity. So here, what we're going to talk about is that you know there is a monolithic application having uh, two business functions, product and inventory. And in the data layer, we have the data for product and inventory. And inventory application need to access the product and the inventory table both at this, uh, in this example. And there is a join operation um, in any relational database. We call it foreign keys. So there is a foreign key relationship between, between these two uh, data tables. If we move this inventory business function, if we intend to move this inventory business function out of this uh, monolith and host it separately, then the, the relationship or the, or the link between the, between the inventory and the data hosting in monolith database is going to break. So how you take care of that? There, there could be many approaches. So I'm going to talk about one approach and uh, still taking care of all the needs of the application. So for example, if I move away the inventory to, uh, to its own uh, Fargate container or to its own Lambda function, inventory application can still access the monolithic database. Nobody's stopping there. But that will cause a tight coupling. And anybody who has worked on a microservices architectures knows that tight coupling is not a good exam, not a good practice. So what do we do? Uh, we, we have many different methods. So here we are sharing the data, which is not good, because it will increase the blast radius. It will, it will increase the overhead during the deployment. The transition method could be create an API, and that API will call uh, these two tables and return the response. That could be one of the approach. But then uh, with this approach, it's, uh, it will always be you know, dependent on the API. But if we move away the inventory data to its own uh, microservice database or purpose-built database, which inventory application can access easily, then it will be, and then for the product data, it, it, can, call the, it, still the, it can still call the API. Now the challenge here is we have introduced the latency. So for the inventory application to access the database, it has to go route through the API and we, it will cause a latency issues if this application has to be in a, in a certain limit. And then another issue we have caused is we have broke the join operation between product and the inventory. Any data which gets, uh, any, any row which gets deleted or updated on the, on the product side will not take effect uh, or will not have any you know, referential integrity uh, with the inventory side. So what do we do? So there are two issues. One of the issues uh, you know, we have seen customers solve is using the caching as well as the event-driven architecture, 
where they offload the product data to the product cache using Elasticsearch or using, uh, sorry, using AWS Elastic Cache Services, and then uh, host offload the data to the cache service and place it close to the application where it is required. And it can be done using event-driven architecture, and this cache will be will keep on updating. Second, uh, to to, pro to solve the second problem, where for example, if we need to delete a, a, a one product, or let's say the product is no more for the sale, and it is deleted from the product catalog, uh, it, that update has to go down to the inventory tables also, because inventory table has that relationship with that. So what do you do that is. You, the event will be broadcasted, the product deleted event will be broadcasted, and that event will be captured by the, uh, by the, date, uh, by the application, uh, inventory application, and it will delete the, that particular row or particular data from the inventory application. A and it can be hard delete or soft delete. Hard delete means you know, deleting it, uh, deleting it uh, like completely, or soft delete means just marking it with a flag, active, yes or no. So one of the customer actually uh, used this uh, pattern for moving away from their SQL Server databases to the DynamoDB experience. Used, uh, and there's a link below for the blog where they talk about this architecture. And Experian did that, and they, they were able to accommodate 50% to 75% of volume growth in their data layer by just moving away from the SQL Server. And when they were moving away, they used this pattern to uh, keep their applications up and running and uh, and, and having the, having, uh, still having that uh, decentralization of their architecture. With that, I will uh, get into the demo. The, first, uh, the demo is for the first pattern, which is about the strangler fig pattern. And we're going uh, gonna to see how we are, uh, you know, how we are going to make this uh, business function, make these three business functions hosted on a monolithic application such as EC2. And, carve out that basket functionality out of this particular e-commerce application. So here we have a you know, monolithic uh, application, three functions, backend by the Dynamo DD database, and it looks like on the browser it will look like this. It's a unicorn shopping where you can log into this ap application, um, add a unicorn to the basket, remove a unicorn from the basket. So we're going to extract that basket functionality as part of this demo, and let's see how we do that. So this is how uh, the application uh, behave on the browser. So this application is hosted on the EC2 instance, which is right here, and it's a one big monolithic application. And it is front-ended by the S3 static website. And uh, if we go to the properties of S3 bucket, uh, it'll give you that URL, which we just accessed using the browser. So now, we first thing, as in the Stringler fig pattern, we did an intercept with the API gateway. But when you have to intercept, you need to understand what are the endpoints this application really have. So this particular application may be having five, six, or ten endpoints, which need to be replicated on the API gateway. So we have to get into the code to understand what are those endpoints. So here we have a unicorn application. If we go to the basket, we have a post method, we have a delete method, we have a get method for adding unicorn to the basket, removing unicorn from the basket, and fetching the unicorns for a particular basket. Similarly, for the user, we have a login and registration methods, which, are, which exist in the code. So we know that these are the five endpoints we have to replicate. And one of the endpoints is getting all the unicorns for a basket for the landing page to be created. The six endpoints which we have to create at the API gateway to intercept all the traffic to the monolith. So that's the first step. So Let's get into the API gateway now. So I'll wait for this recording to keep going. So as we, as we move to the API gateway, well, first thing is we'll create the API, call it Unishop, and make it edge optimized. Create this REST API. Then we'll start creating the resources. Uh, the, the first resource is unicorns. That's a parent resource, and then from and then unicorns resource, we ha we have a child resources such as basket or user or any, anything else for your. So there could be many resources for your application. So create a basket resource, then create a u login uh, user resource. 
And then within the basket resource, you're going to create a UID resource so that you can fetch all the unicorns for a particular basket using the UID of the basket. So here we are trying to create a login resource. Um, and then we'll, we'll start creating the methods. So within the, uh, within the unicorns, we're going to create a get method that will get fetch all the unicorns uh, for, uh, to create a landing page, right? So, and, and here we're going to provide the URL for the monolithic application hosted on EC2. So this is the EC2 URL. So we are just intercepting the traffic. That's all it is, right? Now we're going to test it. So just do a test, and it will get you all the unicorns uh, for, for a particular application, which you can go and shop around. Next, we're going to create the method for the basket functionality. So within the basket, we will create a post method, which is adding unicorn to the basket. Then there will be a delete method. So, so post method, integration type is HTTP. Endpoint URL is going to be the EC2 in, uh, monolithic application URL. Slash unicorn, slash basket. And the content heading will be passed through. And then test this functionality, whether it is working fine, whether the API is able to call the monolithic on EC2. So you're going to make that call you, by testing it. And then the delete method. So again, the same thing, EC2 URL. So this similar way, we're going to create all the endpoints, which is six endpoints we identified, and start intercepting the traffic. Right, so 200 response, that means we are able to make a call to the EC2-based uh, application, right? So this is the get method we're going to create, uh, which will get all the unicorns for a particular basket based on the UID. So it will have an inline parameter slash UID uh, towards the end. So we can test this functionality by just providing a UID for a basket and you know, uh, make a call. Now, once you have tested it, enable the cross-origin resource sharing, important. Then deploy this in a, we are deploying it in a dev stage for now, and it will give you the API URL. Now, what do you do with the API gateway URL? You will just go back to the uh, browser and just test it, uh, uh, you know, it should return you all the unicorns for the landing page to be created. So this is how you do that testing for the API gateway URL. And it should be exactly the same as if we hit the URL for the EC2, because they both are uh, going to address the same method downstream. So here we just, we just try to match the output. Now we know that API gateway is returning good results. So let's go to the S3 bucket which is the, our front-end uh, static website, get the config file, change the EC2 URL to API gateway URL there. As soon as we do that and upload this file, we have intercepted all the traffic using the API gateway. Now we can hit that URL for the, uh, for the application, and now all the data is routing through the API gateway, and it's behaving fine. Now, the next thing is start creating your, start extracting your business function from a basket fu function to the Lambda, backed by the DynamoDB here. So we'll go to the DynamoDB first, create a table for the basket functionality so that we can add unicorn to the basket, remove unicorns, and all this stuff, right? So, so here we're going to DynamoDB, create a table, <coughs> call it Unishop, and UID can be the unicorn, or uh, UID for the basket, actually. That could be the primary key for it. And keep the rest of the settings as default, just for the purpose of this demo. While the table is being created, we'll go back to the Lambda function, start creating those functions for the basket functionality. So in the Lambda, we'll just choose um, Java, uh, we, which is actually the original language of the application. So we'll just use that. and. Uh, select a role which has access and uh, create a function. And once you have, and, and you already have the monolithic code with you, if you have repactored that code by just extracting that code, so here we have that code 
already built uh, using the Maven build here. And we are uploading that code to this Lambda function and just changing the, uh, the, the handler for, for this function. So we have changed the handler. We call it add unicorn to the basket. And once we have this Lambda function, we'll test it. So this is the test case where we have add unicorn to basket and we'll provide the UID for the basket and UID for the, uh, for the unicorn, which needs to be added. So as soon as we call this test this method, it will return a response, added unicorn to basket, and with a 200. Similarly, we can create the other Lambda functions which are required for the, uh, for the basket functionality. So we are creating a remove unicorn from the basket functionality here. So change the handler uh, here and uh, create a test case to remove that unicorn from the basket. And test it, uh, we got the message, unicorn was removed and, unicorn and the basket is deleted because there was only one item in that basket. So once we have tested that, next step is really route the traffic from API Gateway to the Lambda-based uh, basket functionality. So we'll go to the API Gateway and click on those basket methods and route the traffic away from EC2-based functions to the Lambda-based functions, right? So we'll go to the post method here. Within the post method, click on the integration request. There, change from HTTP to Lambda function. Select the region. For this demo, we have a US West 1. And Lambda function is adding Unicorn to basket. Once you do that, save it and just test it. So we're gonna go to the test and provide exactly same inputs which we provided while testing its Lambda functions separately. So let's provide the UID for the unicorn and UID for the basket, okay? So as soon as you test it, it will show you the, those same results which a Lambda functions can return. And you can verify these results by going into the DynamoDB table and see whether the, there is any row exists for this particular test case. So for the simplicity, we just have one data point here that, okay, we added a unicorn to the basket and this is one data which is coming to that DynamoDB database, right? Now, we're gonna go back and just match that UID with the DynamoDB UID, looks like same, so, so we are good. Now, delete method, go to the integration request, change the Lambda function, and select your region, select your uh, Lambda function, and read out the traffic away from EC2 to the Lambda function. Okay, so now, as soon as you test it, uh, it will give the message, Unicorn was removed and basket was deleted, and that's how you kind of read out the traffic down to the uh, functionality hosted on your serverless services. Okay, so, querying the data, database resu results nothing. So now, now that we have changed those endpoints, uh, redeploy this one and check it on the browser. And this time, the, all the basket functionalities are being served from the Lambda-based uh, functions rather from monolith-based functions. So you are, we, are, we can add a unicorn to the basket and remove unicorns and all the stuff we can do uh, by just, uh, and, and you know, just like, uh, you know, previously when we were uh, handling with the monolith-based functions. Right, so after that, the next step is really about cleaning up the code. So you will start cleaning up the basket functionality out of your uh, monolith and then, uh, you know, uh, move away from the monolith uh, for, for this particular business function. So that was the, really the uh, big part of the demo. And next things are, are about the anti pattern so I'm going, there, there could be 20 plus anti patterns or you know, many more. But I'm just going to talk about two anti patterns very quickly in the interest of time here. Uh, so first is distrib don't, don't get into the creating a distributed monolith application. So because distributed monolith is really the disadvantage of both sides of the world. You know, monolith as well as the microservices world. Right, so don't uh, too much engineer your microservices into the nano services. If, it is, if macro services you know, 
kind of, uh, kind of serve the purpose, stay there. And have a tight coupling between uh, all of your uh, services which are going to be chatty together. So have all of them hosted on the one physical unit, right? So that you don't have those distributed monolith uh, symptoms which are really about those are tightly coupled, those are chatty services, network overhead, and all the stuff which comes into. And it, it will definitely increase the blast radius. The second any pattern is about, uh, you might have heard about the enterprise service bus, which is an intelligent pipe connecting different um, you know, dumb endpoints. Uh, here we are, it is connecting service A to service B to C and D. And these, these service bus is nothing but a lot of point-to-point -point connections between these uh, endpoints, right? But don't create, don't make API gateway as your enterpri enterprise service bus. Don't add a filter logic to your API gateway. Don't uh, add too much data. Keep it bare bones, keep it proxy. Don't add too much logic because otherwise it will end up creating a tight coupling. With that, I want to recap what we just learned today about how to start, how uh, migration and modernization are two, uh, two legs of a, of a particular modernization journey and how the architecture evolution looked like to a serverless. And then we spoke about three different phases, how you identify first two to three applications, learn from them, how you start building the foundations, iteratively start uh, you know, adding, adding to the foundation, and then how you can follow some of the industry-proven patterns to, uh, to start modernizing those applications to the serverless stack. With that, I want to leave you with the resources, which is about the Migration Immersion Day. There is a Modernization Immersion Day, and there's a Migration Factory solution for your large-scale migrations, which are based on the rehost methods. And then I want to also recommend a book from uh, Sam Newman, Monolith to Microservices. That's really a good book if you want to understand more about this topic. And then in the end, as I promised, there's a GitHub repo link for Lambda Power Tuning, which you can use to tune your Lambda functions. There are some sessions going on at reInvent to, give, to get your hands dirty about the new service launch, which is about Migration Hub refactor spaces. Second is about the uh, AWS app to container um, service. And third is about the, you know, how to do the intelligent way of discovery, planning, and migrating. So these are some of the workshops you can take advantage of. With that, I just want to uh, wrap up before I open it for Q&A that, you know, there are tons of resources available at AWS. And with those resources, you can definitely take on the modernization with the full confidence. But if there is any need, please reach out to AWS Solutions Architects who have done that over and over again with many of the customers, and they can, they can definitely help you out. And now I open this floor for any questions you might have. And there are two mics right uh, on the two sides of the room. So please use those mics. And if you have any questions you want to ask privately, we, can, we will be hanging around here for a few more minutes, like 15, 20 minutes more. Thank you. Thank you.